Hey everyone, this is Brandon Creer, and I'm here with Monty from Spy Gadget Rentals, my uh, co-host. Uh, today is going to be episode 19, and what we're going to be talking about is what is security awareness? And right. It's a cyber security for you and your business. Monty, how are you doing today? Doing fantastic. Um, feeling good. Um, I got a chance to fast. So we always talk about fasting and exercising, and my fast really is making a difference. Yesterday, you know, was the actual fast day. Today, um, feel, you get the effects of it. It's like delayed, delayed reaction, you guys. So try it out sometimes, and you'll you, and you'll be on like a, a cloud or something for, for a few days. It's fantastic. Oh, it feels good. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing it right now. I'm on day four. Okay. Congratulations. And probably gonna go about another, you know, ten days, maybe maybe fifteen. Wow. And see, see how it goes, and just kind of clear everything out. And it's good for cl clarity, you know. Yeah. And this is like, I mean, it's great. We're talking about, you know, awareness. This is a physical awareness. You kind of understand your body, what you're going through. You understand really how much you're eating and how exactly. much you shouldn't be eating. Like, I know a lot of us kind of go like, oh, yeah, I eat breakfast, I eat lunch, I eat dinner. But when you fast, you realize how much you really need to, you know, sustain yourself to have that energy. And you really limit to smaller meals versus big, all you can eat, you know, buffets. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a fallacy, you guys. When you... When you eat in, in, in Western culture, see, you have access to food all the time. Your refrigerator is always stocked. The shelves are always stocked. Every, food is within arm's reach at any given point in time. But see, I think naturally uh, we don't need to stuff our faces around the clock, really. And your body, uh, for better or for worse, needs time to recuperate. And it needs time, it need, it needs time to, to get out, get out of your system, the toxins and the poisons and everything else. And, and when you fast, that's what your body's doing. It's, it's getting rid of those toxins and poisons, and it's actually regulating a lot better. So, yeah, take a look at it and see for yourself. And, but it's been linked to cancer, helping, helping to, to uh, help us fight cancers, aging processes. There's research, is going, research going on talking about this anti-aging mechanisms, uh, more mm -hmm. or less. There's, a, there's like a, a whole list of um, benefits that, that, that result as uh, – in terms of when you fast. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's what we have to look at, you know, and it just dropped my camera, but yeah, that's, what have, <laughs> that's what we have to look at is the benefits that you get from cleaning your body and cleaning your system, right? Exactly. And, that, and, that, and that's the benefit when you're fasting, your body has a natural chance to heal and, ha and you don't eat as much. So your body's not using your metabolism to consume. And right? so it's and, actually has time to heal. And a good segue into cyber awareness may be, because we're, we're, we're on high alert, you guys. Our government agencies typically tell us all over the world, you know, that the, the terrorists are plotting this and they're planning that and be aware. So you're on high alert and that's not good for stress. Our bodies were not meant to constantly be filled with adrenaline and I'm high alert, right? I'm, you know, looking around and trying to find the bad guys and the, and the, and the bombs or whatever it is, right? That's not natural. So your body is actually producing adrenaline almost 24 seven. So mm -hmm. the, the, the connection to fasting as such may be, it it's gonna help our bodies to better counter the, the, the stress levels, the high stress levels that we encounter uh, as a result of these uh, news announcements that come on the major broadcasting stations and, the, and what's written in the papers and everything else. So yeah, I think that, that may be a good way of looking at you know, what, what we can do to, to better uh, prepare ourselves for the constant dangers that are that, that we're told they're always around us well again you gotta think of it this way it's i mean like you're talking about it's the stress of everything like technology us kind of being always connected yes you know, you know you're th talking about adrenaline adrenaline is the byproduct of cortisol right yeah melatonin right. and cortisol which is your melatonin is your relaxed hormone cortisol is your your stress hormone and it's your fight or flight so and yeah what, think of it this way the analogy is imagine you're being chased by a tiger right you're not going to sit there and go to Melaton and go, oh, this is so nice. You're going to go, oh, my God, and you're going to take off, right? And you're going to knock the guys out of, out of the way, and you're trying to get out of there so the tiger doesn't eat you. Well, exactly. I mean, with electronic devices and kind of going back into awareness, we're always connected. We're always vibrating. We're always kind of around these waves, and we're always kind of being around, you know, news and information, and, and news is always kind of like has this uh, – undertone of fear and scarcity oh my god there's the fires out here and shots being fired here and someone's been arrested and this has been happening and now i mean we're talking about like cyber security and awareness this has been hacked this company's been compromised you could lose your data and oh my god you know if you use this you could you could 
you know, <laughs> give out your credit card. So it kind of puts you in this fear state. You're like, oh my God, like, what do I do? And I think, I mean, going into our, our show today, really talking about uh, security awareness, talks about all those aspects, talks about the physical, the mental, the emotional, and the technology. And right. I, mean, I, looked, I looked up a definition today and it was, uh, is the knowledge of, a, of an organization or person possesses regarding the protection of their surroundings and safety. This can be physical, mental, emotional, and technology. So I know a lot of them kind of, when you look at security awareness, they're all going forth to, they're going towards the corporation, security awareness training and all that. Right. But security awareness training has to be, you know, uh, a personal approach to the corporation as well, because you can be compromised now personally. Like we talked about social engineering. Oh, sure. Sure. Right, someone calling and saying, hey, you know what? I'm X and Y company. And, I mean, I got a call twice last week from someone from Microsoft that my computer oh. was sending off these alerts, right? I thought the and IRS that, called me. I mean, what, wasn't, that, wasn't that legitimate I, as well? They, I had to hurry up and send out a, a give them a credit card or something? That wasn't legitimate? <laughs> I don't think so. If you, if you did, I, mean, I, I would check. Okay. Right? I'm still, I'm still waiting for the Microsoft rep to come and fix my computer, right? Right. But, but this is the thing. If you're not aware of your surroundings and say you're busy, you're doing something, you're working with the kids, you're, you know, you're, you're on the phone and you're jumping around and someone calls you and says, you know, I'm the IRS in your situation or, you know, someone in my situation when they're saying that I'm there for Microsoft. And I went through the call. I spent an hour on the call to go through it okay. to see what they were asking because I want to do some, you know, my own oh, yeah, sure. security research is kind of what questions they're asking. How do they put me into a state or try to put me in a state of fear so I will do what they want? And it was interesting because I was, you know, positive. I was, okay, you know, what do you need to do? And then what happened was as they were going through the call, you could tell they were going, hey, you know, your viruses are going to corrupt your data. You're going to lose personal information. You're going to lose your banking information. So you're trying to put me in that fear state. Next, I was like, oh, you know, I'm not worried about that. That's okay, but I, I still want you to fix it. The next thing what they did was they went on to, then now you're legally responsible. You're going to get sued and the cops are going to come and, and find you and do all these bad things to you. So now I'm going, okay. So they went to a personal aspect. Now they went to a legal aspect. And so whatever they're trying to do to get me to say, you know, click on this, do this. And then, of course, you know, they, they are asking me, you know, where to click on, you know, click on your Windows tab, open up exactly. Run, and do all this great right. stuff. So I opened a notepad and I was typing all this stuff out. You know, what? okay, they want me to go to Windows. You know, they want me to type on the Windows key and the Windows and get, like, open up Run. What code do they want me to <laughs> And I was writing all this down as a notepad. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm doing that. Oh, yeah, great. And what do you see on the screen? Oh, yeah, you know, I, I see, you know, I see the Run tab because I know visually what, what they're, they're going for. And we're about an hour into the call and the guy goes, you know, you're not doing this, are you? I'm like, no, no, I'm doing this. You know, what else do you need me to do? Kind of tell me more. <laughs> and then he hangs up. Oh, really? Right? So <laughs> That's crazy. And, and this is the thing I want people to know is, you know, and this is your security awareness is when you're looking at threats, all kinds, it can be something that's a physical threat that, you know, you see it right in front of you, or it could be something you can't, it's not tangible. You can't right. see it, and they get authoritative figures to you know mimic or you know oh, sure. car owners to kind of pretend like they're that these you know authoritative figures that put you in a state that you're kind of like, oh my god, is it this person? If you don't know, hang up and call the company, call the people directly, right? right. Find, find their number from their own website, from the company's website, and call them directly and ask them, you know, did you call me? Now to let you guys know. Microsoft doesn't get real alerts of your system, right? <laughs> so just to let you know, they're not going to out of the blue call you to fix your computer. And and remind people, you guys, um, re remind those people who are calling you, who are all um, stressed out and excited. I mean, they, they, they try to get you in a, a state of excitement where you have to hurry up and give out information. You have to hurry up and, and, and assist them to accomplish what it is that they want, right? Um, so even if, even if you talk about it's a fear state, right? Pardon? It's a fear state. I mean, you put anyone yeah. in a sense of fear. Like if I called you and right. I, I don't know what your family said, but I called you and said, Oh, your son's in the hospital. Oh, sure. You know, oh my God, he's in critical condition. We need your credit card right now. Right. You might like, Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's my son. Right. And I put you in that <laughs> scare, you know, we you yeah. can't call the thing cause we only have 10 minutes. And, you know, if we don't right. get this done right now and they put you in this fear state that you can't logically think. Right. Yeah, t 
typically you you want to be more cautious nowadays. So take a deep breath. Let the person know, if even if it's a company, let them know. Look, I'm concerned about my my personal information being given out to anyone. I'm concerned about my customers' information being given out to anyone. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call you back. I'm going to do some checking and just take a few. Give yourself a, a little bit of opportunity to do some checking and make sure because sometimes that situation is not dire. It's not life or death, and 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 we can actually find out who the person is. Is it legitimate? And whether or not we're going through the proper protocol, because me and Brian are experts. Okay, we talk about social engineering. We talk about how to get other people to give out information, you know, very quickly and and under duress, and 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 that way, you know, you 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 don't check all the uh, the eyes and dot and check all the T's and dot all the eyes and everything properly when when you're trying to hurry and somebody's trying to push you towards giving them an answer or information. So this is one question I have for uh, for William as well as uh, Danny. What are, what are some cybersecurity threats that you guys have faced or know of that you're kind of like, you know what, people need to know more about this? So, Monty, let's kind of ask, let's talk about this for ourselves. You know, what are the areas of, of security awareness? Well, I think we always have to start with the youngest people. In other words, if we can educate people growing up, the, the younger people, uh, early on to be our cyber experts, to, to be our eyes and ears. And, and we have to take a look at how they interact with the things that they interact with. In other words, if, if I'm 10 or 11 or something and I'm inter interacting with games, and if that shows me, you know, if that's going to show me how to uh, um, get on the internet, check my computer, or, or what to give out or what not get, then that's, that's the way we need to frame that for kids, right? Put it in a game format. I uh, believe it or not, um, there's uh, games out there and I'll give a lot of uh, these links to Brandon so he can incorporate them into the lab later on. So always go back you guys and take a look at the links and the, and the, and the different things that are part of the resources to complement what we're doing. But yeah, we, we're learning that there's nothing wrong with a kid going online and, and, and interacting with a game format to mm -hmm. take a look at what it is to play a game and to go through the various um, interactions as if they were a cyber cop or something, or, 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 or just in case someone is trying to ask them too much information. You know, maybe you want to maybe you want to reward them points or something. And then you know, you take a look at the kids, and you take a look at the teenagers, and then you interact with them and, and the way they interact with the internet and etc. Then you take a look at the elderly people, right? What is their life like and how do they interact with people? And so we need to address these different um, groups in the way that they typically interact, not the way that we think they should interact with computers and, and, others, and other social situations, but how do you actually interact with, with uh, others and, and, and such? Well, Williams made a point, uh, when installing new software, there are check boxes that you have to uncheck, otherwise you get adware in your browser sometimes. So he's exactly. right, you know, some of these free softwares or even paid softwares, they have add-on or upsells on, oh, do you want McAfee or do you want, you know, Semantic or do you want this other, you know, you know, add-on software that you're right, it ha can have adware or malware in it. So right. good, good point, William. Um, one thing I, I think I want to add to that, Monty, what you're saying is, Understanding physical securities, physical security awareness. I mean, kind of the areas that I like to think about when we look at security awareness is physical security. When you're looking at security awareness around you because of your surroundings, you know, who's around you, where, where are you, you know, how are you connected? You know, what's the devices? What's the environment you're around? Because, I mean, we talk about shoulder surfing in previous videos, but, you know, people could overlook your shoulder and see why, you're, you know, when you're typing your password. Exactly. Uh, say, you're, say you're online at Starbucks and you're sitting there and you're, you're bringing up your phone and you type in your, your secure code to get into your phone. Well, or you do like for Samsung, you do the swipe, whatever the swipe directions you do. And someone's right. sitting there and they're watching you do that. Well, what happens is, you know, and I've, and we talked about this the other day when I was talking to an older lady, when she got compromised where, where someone stole her wallet. Well, someone can reach into your, reach into your pocket, reach into your purse, whatever that may be. And you might be in a heated conversation or talking to someone or working on something and they pull that device out and now they can have access to it. So like Danny's saying, it's like, you know, you look at shoulder surfing, right? And you, know, you want to be very mindful of that is your surroundings, who's around you, what you have available, what you have up in front of you. 
You know, what do you have open? You know, do you have it so people can't see what you're working on? So these are a lot of good things when you look at physical security and the people around you. Is someone kind of looking suspicious in the corner, right? Have right. they have they put up a rogue, you know, uh, wireless router there that also now you're connecting to because you think it is Starbucks, right? Oh, but really, sure. it's Starbucks. <laughs> it's Starbucks one, and he's you know capturing all the packets that are going through, which is a lot of your information. So again, having that awareness, yeah. you know, uh, tailgating. You know, when people follow you into secure buildings and, and, and secure areas or even your personal building, right? Exactly. Like if you're going yeah. to home and someone's tailgating you in, do you know them? You know, is it your next door neighbor or is it someone you don't know about? So really having kind of awareness around you because, again, you don't know. Even eavesdropping. Some people might have me having a conversation talking about work. Oh, yeah, I'm working on this sales deal with this client and I'm doing this great thing. And, yeah, their username and password to get in their account is blah, 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 blah. Uh, sure. now, some, now someone overhears that and guess what? They're like, oh, right. I got access. Oh, you sure. Know? Yeah. I see. I'm in a spy business, you guys. And um, a lot of our customers, that's 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 what they want to do. That's what we do. If Brandon is having a conversation and he's talking too much and we may compel him somehow, I may get him to talk a lot about some particular sensitive area of his life and we can put a listening device in his office. Um, yeah. College is straight up depth of your laptop definitely uh you know yeah i can get you know our customers may want to plan on a listening device in your home or your office to get you to start talking about a lot of the things that are critical to your company and that's how trademarks right phones etc turn on the phone and the microphone uh, turn on the microphone on the phone right uh, you, you name it well as um, we know Monty, i'm just going to kind of point points yeah. the phone the like you were using the apple one that device is so strong, you can leave it and hang it close to that person and it'll pick up the conversation. Exactly. Sometimes, uh, I don't know if you guys ever experienced this or not, but sometimes I'll be talking to a friend and Siri will think that I said something to her and she'll be like, can I help you or something? You know, I'm like, I didn't say anything to you, Siri. Right. But uh, yeah, William brought up a good point too. I don't want to overlook that one. Look at your identity online. Look at your username. How does it look to you when you get the you know return search and, and, it, and it, how, how do you look online, okay? Are, if you're trying to be more private and Google is making you a lot less private in terms of you know disclosing too much information, that's mm -hmm. something you may want to look into. Go back every once in a while and, 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 and look at what Google is giving away in your profile. Uh, Facebook and Google and all those guys are giving us a little bit more control in terms of what ultimately is put on the internet. So yeah, go back and, and investigate yourself and, and see how you look online. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, for sure. Right, and I mean, that's a good point. I mean, when you're looking at your identity, and this is, comes down to personal security, right? When I talk about physical, kind of, you know, you're looking at your surroundings, your car, your information. I mean, we, we, we talked about the other day about, you know, a uh, Jeep getting hacked, right? Even like physical security of being awareness of all your devices and everything around that the compromises, baby monitors, you know, doing the research as you're purchasing inter the internet of things and we talked about that in, pre in previous shows so if you if you ever have a question about any previous shows you can go to my website knssconsulting.com and on the blog all the recordings are all there uh and what you can do is go and look at the device and see online what are the white papers what are the compromises before you purchase it do the research i mean this is security awareness because some people buy devices because of the benefits and the features oh my god i can do this i can connect from work i can you know go to this console on this website i can see you know everything that's happening in my house and my home and my car and do this and turn on the stove and look in the fridge do all that but so can a hacker <laughs> you right, do the exact same thing, and know where you're not home, and go shopping. So yeah, you know, if their security is not not set, and if there's white papers or information online how to compromise that system, then you know it's not secure. Let me ask you a question, Brandon. Um, there is an article that I was reading about China actually having a spot the spy type of program. Mm -hmm. I, I'll give you the links to the uh, the blogs and such that I was that I was writing up on the same subject. But basically, this is, the way it's, this is the way it's framed. China, of all countries, is saying Facebook wants to be your inner, exactly. <laughs> they want to be everything to everyone. Uh, well, you th think about that. that. Danny's bringing up a good point because yeah. they're bringing up internet.org, which is now providing internet into areas where they wouldn't have it. So they're oh, okay. doing it. Right. right? So Danny's That's actually bringing up a valid point here. It's not like yeah. it's kind of funny, like they want to be it, but they're actually taking the action right now. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg is creating 
internet connections through uh, satellite and Wi-Fi oh, okay. yeah, right. through areas where they wouldn't have internet connection. So that, that they're going to control pretty much from cradle to grave what what it is to have you get online, what it is to have you have the profile and all, all the information on Facebook. So the, uh, yeah, they'll probably be controlling the entire sphere of, of being online and, and paying for the service at the same time somehow by giving up more than likely everything private about you. Uh, but well, what I was referring to earlier, before I forget, mm -hmm. um, China has a spot the spy program, you guys. It's actually a public service in China now for everyone to look around. We talk about physical awareness and physical security. They want to encourage everyone to look around and they have billboards and they have the bus bill, the bus boards, uh, the, the, the signs on the buses and they have a, uh, whatever form of public display, you know, make sure that you don't talk about critical government cup corporate related information to suspicious people. And if you think they're suspicious, how to report it and all that. And I'm thinking, Brandon, and I want your input on this. What do you think about what if we had public service announcements? What if we had radio spots, a or something that said, look, you guys, this is a big problem. This is a major issue. Let's let's do more. I mean, what do you what is your feedback? Well, let's, let's ask Dan, Danny and, and uh, William, would they do it? You know, would they report it if they were, you know, at a situation where someone was at a coffee shop and they heard two people talking, you know, and, you know, this confidential information that they shouldn't be talking about, would they report it? Would they take the action? You know, and this is my my point here is that and why I'm asking Danny and William what they think is because I think right now in North America, we ignore it. A lot of the people that are not security in the security field kind of negate it kind of like it's not our problem. I'm not going to deal with it. I don't want to okay. get involved. It's too right. much of a hassle. So I'm just going to ignore it and move on. You know, that's the kind of feeling I feel when it comes to uh, security awareness and when it comes to IT security, a lot of people – you know, in the general population, not the IT guys and the guys are into technology, but more the kind, the general population are kind of looking at it kind of like, ah, it's not going to happen to me. I don't have to worry about it. And Danny's saying like, it's, it's the people are too willing to share information. And this is the thing, when it came to social media in the early 2000s, when social media came out, People were like, oh, my God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to share all this. I'm going to share my kids, my photos and all that. And it expanded. It, it, you know, it just exponentially expanded to the point where now people will share everything, vacations, their, you know, their bowel movements. I mean, you name it under the, <laughs> yeah. sun, under the sun. Right. right. What happens is they don't realize that how much information they're getting, giving away. Uh, right, exactly. William's, saying, William's saying, depending on what type of information is being uh, spied on, so, I mean, this is what I'm asking you. Well, say, for example, me and Monty, you know, we're sitting there, we're talking about uh, the Federal Reserve, right? And we're talking about the Federal Reserve and saying, hey, you know what? Here's how to access a million dollars. Here, I'm going to tell you how to do it and how to compromise the system. You know, if you overheard that, would you report it? And this yeah. Is th this is the thing that, I mean, and there's, of course, don't get me wrong, there's a fine line for people. You know, you don't want to report everyone in the sun because maybe someone's playing a video game or something along that line. But there's certain things that we know as, as 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 individuals that you know we can see compromise, we can see threats, and I'm gonna point out on another side of a problem which is gonna arise if we do that. But if we start reporting them, we have to make sure that we understand we understand what a threat is, what a vulnerability is, so we can report it properly. If we're seeing you know a grandmother talking to her daughter and saying, "Oh, oh, Brandon, we lost you." Yeah, if a um. Grandmother's talking to her, the daughter, and they're disclosing uh, absolutely too much information. You, you always want to keep in mind, uh, you guys, how, how would that information benefit someone else? So, so definitely, and let me see, um, Danny saying Zuckerberg was quoted to, to, as saying, sharing is the new social norm that replaces security. I can get the exact quote if needed. Oh, sure, yeah, Mark Zuckerberg is probably going to dumb down the consequences of how uh, serious the implications could be because, you know, yeah, he wants us to not consider the, uh, the implications. You know, if, yeah, Facebook is founded on the principle that we are the product and they're, they're the beneficiary, right? They're, they're monetizing and profiting from us being the product. So yeah, as long as we share every single aspect of our lives, 
uh, Mark Zuckerberg and and and, and the, all the advertisers and that he's working with, for instance, they'll uh, continue to make tons and tons of money from us being so lenient with our personal information. But we're finding out that yeah, there is money, and we're finding out more and more every day. And I'll let Brian uh, Brandon pick up where he left off. <laughs> he dropped out somehow. Blab keeps booting me out. I, I guess we're talking about something very sensitive. That you got to be careful because what you say on Blab. The censors, sorry. <laughs> I know. CIA is after me. So what I was saying is that, you know, you know, we're going to report. We have to know the threats and the vulnerabilities and understand what these are so we can report them properly. But the problem is if we start reporting, the systems, the law enforcement the, and the agencies that we're reporting to can't handle the overflow. I mean, they couldn't handle all the reports. I know right now my local police station, when I went and talked to them about, you know, just asking questions, how do I report a cybersecurity threat or, or attack? They were like, we can't take it on. We're getting 500 really? a month. Oh, so the know, system's every, not even set up for to, 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 to accommodate us. Well, that's what I'm saying. The problem is right now is that, you know, they're ever in data. I mean, I read an article, and I think we talked about this several blabs ago, that in four years, the industry is going to be so short-staffed, they're going to be needing 1.5 million IT security professionals just to try to fill the gap, right? And that's an estimate. They're thinking it's going to be a wow. lot more than that. And you're looking 1.5 million IT professionals. And these are qualified you know, people that understand the industry that are able to do it. I mean, it's it's getting the exponential. And this is why security awareness, when we start looking at from the, the mother to the father to the kids to, you know, these, you know, individual entrepreneur to the small business to the medium size, but everyone has to have a, a, a base knowledge of, you know, security awareness. <laughs> because you think about this in school, you have – Officer John that comes in and teaches you don't talk to strangers, don't do this. Make sure you're, you know if a stranger approaches you, you, you go and tell a police officer or your teacher or something. But they don't talk about technology now. They don't talk about being aware of you know your awareness when it comes to technology. Yeah, Danny is saying that it's not the CIA you have to worry about. It's the other three letter agencies that shall remain nameless unless you want to be tracked. Well, uh, let oh, me. We, 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 we've named them. We've named them. <laughs> FBI, NSA. You know, yeah. they, they can come up. They can hire us. I mean, that's okay. You know, we're we're good with that. But you know, they're tracking us. That's good. If they don't yeah. want us to talk about it, because again, Monty brought it up. FBI just got hacked. Right. <laughs> Federal Reserve just got hacked. Right. Officer Personnel Management <laughs> just got hacked. IRS just got hacked. I mean, I, I can't. It's easier to talk about who didn't get hacked as compared to who who did get hacked. So you guys, let's make sure that we understand that they yep. are, they, they, they're reaching, they're grasping at straws. They're trying to figure out how to get a handle on this at the same time. So yeah, this is a one major effort that all of us, I think, have to contribute to. And I just wanna let you guys know, I just pay, pay, I pasted in the dialog box over there. In China, they actually have uh, posters in a housing complex and it reads, Everyone has the responsibility to fight against and prevent espionage. Okay, this is what's on posters and a housing complex and the city of Tianjin. Okay, so they're they're making it a they're making a public effort to, to to let everyone know as you walk down the street through the cities and the towns and whatever that they want people to be to report and and to acknowledge and and to understand that these threats are real. And I think in the United States, we really need to be more serious about, like Brandon mentioned, if I go to the police station, if I call a certain number and say, I see something suspicious, okay, we all heard that the NSA and those guys are collecting data. Well, guess what? This is data. This is more information. And it's not on, uh, up to me to filter through it and decide what's, what's important or not important. It's up to you as the three-letter agency to determine what you're going to do with this information, how you're going to react to it. And if you can't use it and act on it properly, then then, I, then we need to get some people in those government offices to try and figure out how do you deal with the abundance information of information that we as citizens are, are going to be uh, given to you. Well, I think that's what the problem is. They're going to get inundated with information and they're, <laughs> not, they're not going to be able to do the proper investigation. They're right. not going to be able to up with the incident they're not gonna be able to track and troubleshoot it and, and you know you know do a forensic report they're not gonna be able to do all that because if they're getting a small local police station is getting 500 cyber security <laughs> reports a month that's not on top of all their other investigations that's exactly. specific that's 500 yeah. you imagine you imagine us 
each of us. I don't know what business you know Danny's in or, Will, or, or Williams in, but imagine yeah. us getting 500 new clients individually that I had to deal with every single sure. month. There's right. no way I could handle it. There's not enough time in the days, not time in the week, enough time in the month for me to handle 500 new clients myself. I'd have to get right. a team, and this is what we have right. to do now: is look at a team effort. And exactly. if we can prevent locally that you're preventing, you know, attacks, compromises, you're securing your network, you're securing your system, you're educating your kids, you're educating your family, you're educating 360 family, friends, colleagues, everyone around you about security awareness. Then you're more protected, and the less compromises that could happen, right? And then what happens is if they're secure and they educate, it just kind of balloons out. It's like that. Uh, that viral type of marketing where, you know, if you tell one person, they tell two people and they tell two more people and they tell five more people and it just keeps going out. Uh, it just, it'll just help more and more people. Brandon, 500 new clients that are expected pro bono work. Laugh out loud. Yeah, no, you know, <laughs> everyone has to get paid for their time and their value. But I'm saying even if, <laughs> even if you had that, like, I mean, you had 500 clients that were paying you your your rate if it's five hundred fifty dollars an hour, hundred dollars an hour. That like I need your help. There's no way you could handle it personally, one on one. You need to get a team behind you, and I think that's what's problem with the infrastructure right now, is that the infrastructure can't support it because they have to keep hiring on new people to handle the flow of it, of tickets and, and escalations and incidents that are happening that they just can't do it right now. And that's why all this data is being stored and held on the side where it's like, okay, well, here's another incident number, you know, 5,002, incident 5,003. Okay. We'll just store that away. And, you know, there's nothing we can do right now. We can't prevent it. We just keep logging it. And another critical area uh, I want to uh, get to if, if possible has to do with privacy policies. Mm -hmm. Um, we have privacy policies um, that we have to sign every time we go to a website, we want to shop, we want to go on a social network. Someone says, click my privacy policy and state that you agree with the terms and conditions, right? And it's 20 pages long. And we're saying to ourselves, okay, I don't have time to read this. So I'm going to go ahead and check off. And if anything happens, I'll address it later, right? Mm -hmm. Well, believe it or not, Brandon, and I want your, your opinion on this, Brandon, and you guys as well. When, we, when we're dealing with these privacy policies, have they gotten to the point where we're more intimidated by them? Are they so convoluted? Is the jargon, hi Evangelos, he's a very good commenter and contributor as well. Um, have these privacy policies on the internet, you guys, gotten so complicated and, and, and so complex that we, we, we run from them, we sign them and, and, and we just quickly go on and we say, okay, we'll address it later on, right? And this is my opinion, okay? Do we, should we have some sort of, uh, you know how in the food labeling industry, we get to the point where it has to be formatted and structured so we can take one food item and compare it to the other food item quickly and determine, okay, for me, I'm concerned about sodium. There it is, right? I'm concerned about um, sugars. There it is, right on the label. And it's color coded and it's, and it's, it's, it's formatted and it's structured. Should we have more? Should we have the same in the, in the as far as privacy policies are concerned? Should we have apps? Should we have bots or something that take a look at Brandon's privacy policy and determines whether or not it's safe, not so safe, very unsafe, or something? I mean, where, where do we go with this? I, I agree. I mean, there's got to be a user friendly um, description, and it's got to look at two different levels. You got to look at one kind of a brief description right from the start. And it has to be validated by a, a reputable source too. It can't be like me saying, oh, I'm secure. And then you right. come in there and I'm not. And I haven't done VeriSign security or semantic security, evaluate my security and my policies and making sure. I need to have a validation and a, cer a certificate saying that I follow certain practices and policies. But it should be something that's up front and center that one, you have like a validation or a certificate. Two, there should be like a, a brief description. Right, something that's easy to digest, easy to read, easy to go through. And then for someone that's a little bit more technical and analytical, then there should be the detail, the really meat of it, right? Where it comes to the point where, yeah, you can read each section, each subsection and okay. what they're dealing with it. Because again, like you said, how many of us can sit there and kind of go through everything you're thinking about? Think of all the apps on your phone, all the 40 to maybe 400 apps that you have on the phone and go read each of their 
privacy policies, their security policies, their processes, their guidelines. Read them all. And some of them are 40, some of them are 100 pages each. And read them all and then understand them. That's the other thing is, as we know, is the legalities. They all speak in legal terms. So the, the layman or general person is not going to understand what it means. They're going to have to go and speak to a lawyer every time they want to install an application. Right? And that's the problem is, is that you, then you're going to go, okay, well, I'll install it anyways. What's the worst that's going to happen? Exactly. And, <laughs> and, and then the worst happens. And you're and like, the worst oh, my happens, God. Right. <laughs> Yeah, see, I, I think that's what they want. They they want you to go ahead and, and sign on, right, and think, I'll try to address the issue after the fact. But that's when the damage has been done because, you know, the lawyers are, are, are using jargon that we're not going to take the time to define all these terms and, and, and what these words mean and the implications of the of what's going on. But, yeah, I think ultimately what, 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 we're, what we're giving away is is our privacy. And see, that's and this is this is typically what happens. You, you, you collect millions of data records, that database gets compromised, okay, by another company, and then all, all that information is, 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 is out there now. It's given to someone else, and, 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 now, and now it's too late. Now you can't take it back. So, yeah, we need to make sure we understand that. We under, what, what are the implications? Who are you going to give my information to? What are you going to do with my email? You know, are you going to market to to to? Are you going to market to me directly? Are you going to give it out to a third party? Are are you going to keep it and not market it or remarket it or something? Um, you know exactly what's going on. And I think we need to put a lot of more a lot more emphasis on maybe getting some apps. And I, I was told I, I was reading somewhere, Brandon, that Microsoft a long time ago had a P P three P type of program where it had to do with something incorporated into the browsers or something whereby if I'm viewing a privacy policy on a on a web page, it would actually take in that information and sort of structure it and sort of like rate it and give me the give me some ideas in terms of what I'm up against. Right. Okay. Right? Summarize it, okay. Yeah, exactly. So I I think that was a very good idea. This was years right. and years ago, right? But you know I'm, su I'm surprising Google is not doing it right now. <laughs> Well, you know, let me tell you what Google is doing. Google has finally decided, you guys, and I want you to do your own independent research onto this. Google has finally decided that I got, instead of having a thousand pages talking about the privacy policy in terms of conditions, they're, they're putting out m more videos that try to summarize and, and try to refine what it is that we're doing in our interactions with Google. So now you can look at a, a video and you can get a, a sort of a summary idea in terms of what they're saying with all the, with all the 10,000 lines of text. And believe it or not, Brandon, I did this years ago with my company. I recorded a video of me reiterating our privacy, return, guarantee, policies, et cetera, and I put it in a video, right? Mm -hmm. Probably eight years ago <laughs> because I, I decided that, you know, my, my privacy policy started this, this much text, and then it became, you know, you, you can't even see my hands. It's going off the screen. Right. But but it became so long that I thought, let me just put this in a video. And I put it out there, right? Mm -hmm. But I had no idea that this was something that we really need to take a look at. In mm -hmm. other words, you, Brandon might be graphically oriented. I might be picture oriented. You may be more analytical. Someone may be more verbal or something as far as how they think and everything like that. So we need to consider how do people uh, get information, receive information, process it, et cetera, and make sure that we get to the point of, of what's important to me when I'm interacting with you, just like I want to see on that label on that food product, I want to see the sodium. For me, that's important. Brandon may want to take a look at the, um, what? The, the, the fat it take, right? The so, fat or something, yeah. you know? Yeah. Right. Well, for sure. I mean, that's the thing. And, and when we're looking at overall, you're looking at this kind of, you know, summary of everything. You should have a snapshot of everything. So at least you kind of have a base of, you know, you right. understand there's a level of encryption, there's backups, there's a redundancy, you know, the, you know they, they don't share your information. The exactly. Your information is protected. Like you should have these high level. And I know Evan's saying here, and I like to ask him about this, is that I'm trying to get rid of passwords forever. I like to know what he's doing to do that. Um, Biometrics, yeah. maybe or something. Yeah. Evan, I'd like to see what he's doing. Uh, we need a new world. Uh, we need search world engine. new. Uh, yeah. We need world new search engines that is open source. We can control of our data, not private corporations. 
And then William saying, don't use the same username and password that you use for the thing that you are important for a website or unfamiliar with. So example, right. like we, we, yeah. we talked about this on, in the last episode, right? was about password policies, right? Not having, you know, a username and password that goes blanketed across all, you know, your social sites, your websites, you know, anywhere you log in, any medium that you log into, have, and making sure you're having different username and passwords and not having the point where you can memorize them. Right. Yeah. These, these should be complicated 12 to 16 characters, special characters, uppercase, lowercase, you know, and what happens is those passwords should be stored on maybe a secure USB that you have encrypted. Right? And you encrypt that USB. And then what happens is when you plug it in, you unencrypt it. And then you have your list of username and passwords that you log in with. Right? That's a good security policy, right? That now from now on, as long as no one gets access to that USB and you don't provide them, you know, uh, the, the encryption key, you're, you're good. Your password should be secure. And again, your encryption key, you know, your password for your encryption should be, again, 16 characters, should be unique to all the rest. Right. Again, then that one you should remember to get into. And then, then after that, you're able to secure all your passwords where people are trying to write in notebooks and then someone can, you know, shoulder surf and see in your notebooks. People are trying to do all these other things. And my best you know, policy is, is that if you have a notebook, then yeah, use it, but make sure it's secure. I, I tell people you grab a flash drive with the USB, a small little stick, uh, create a uh, notepad and just put all your username and password that, and then encrypt it, encrypt that file. And that's and then you can double encrypt it. I mean, I've seen some people do it where they encrypt the USB and they encrypt the file. Good idea, good point. And then also, you guys see psychologically, we 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 tend to look at passwords um, in terms of whether or not we think that they are unique and 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 different, right? But hackers see they have these things called dictionaries, right? And they go through a lot of the common, what we think are uncommon, but they go through a lot of these password and, and, and numerical and uh, 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 character combinations that we use all the time. And they're, and we're, Carnegie Mellon did a study and you guys can click on that link and you can see that you can look at, they, they're giving you the opportunity, you guys, to look at passwords, one compared to the other, and, and, and you get a chance to try and figure out whether or not you think this password it's more complex or more difficult to, 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 to think of or, or whatever than the other one. And what they're finding out is psychologically, we are not choosing the more complicated passwords, okay? So let's take a look at what we think is a complicated password as compared to what the experts are, 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 think, are telling us. But do you know why that is, Monty? Do you know why they're not picking the complicated password? Because they want to remember them. <laughs> exactly. And that's what you talk about. When I when I talk to people and, and do a consulting, one of the things I get is, well, how am I going to remember it? Exactly. Right? Well, like you're not supposed to remember it. As well. I said, yeah, if you could remember it, it's something like your dog's name, your anniversary, all that. I can socially engineer you somehow over time and find that information, especially in this day and age when it comes to, you know, digital marketing and all that information that's out there. I can find it out going through all these different areas, AKP. Uh, so it's all these things that you gotta look at now is yeah. that how are you going to secure yourself? And now uh, Evan is saying that he's gonna try Biomatrix personal, uh, from personal DNA to a QR code QR sender. Code scanner. Yeah, a scanner installed on the hand or an arm or people. Now, this is just my opinion, Evan. Always be careful of stuff that people are putting into the skin. And then I've seen it like on uh, documentaries where they're putting into the skin and they can swipe, you know, the the keypad or whatever that may be, and they can get an access points and they can scan into their computer and all that. The only thing I'm concerned about is the leakage and, and the health concerns about that. They don't know yet because it's still being tested. They're saying it's still safe and they're being protected, but we won't know for five to 10 years the repercussions of you know, any, yeah. health, any health issues because it, it takes time to distribute to see over time how it affects the body. So that's yeah, the, we, go ahead, Monty. Yeah, we, we may not have to go there right away. That's the good news because in my business, we got lots of customers call in. For, you know, I think I got a chip, a chip implanted in my skin and I need a, a device to detect it, right? Well, we're not quite there yet, you guys. So don't panic right away because the chips being implanted into our skins and such, as Brandon pointed out, we got major health concerns with that. I got a very good idea in terms of the power requirements of powering a chip in your body to make it run all the time so that, you know, you can get in your house and your office in your car. We're not there yet. It's not safe. So, so let's not worry about that right now. 
But I think Evan did hit on a very good point when he talked about biometrics. See, once upon a time, biometrics was the holy grail, probably 10 years ago at least. And, and, and it was supposed to hit the market. It was supposed to be on every single door, every single house and every car or whatever, right? I'm supposed to use my finger or my hand or my eye, retina or something and get in and out of the grocery store. Well, guess what? There was a significant d delay <laughs> because the implementation was a little bit more complicated than what the industry thought. In other words, when we're reading fingerprints and hands and eyes, at that point, the technology was not quite there. But now we're progressing to the point where we're getting a little bit more clearer picture in terms of how to make it reliable. So Wells Fargo, for instance, is taking a look at their corporate clients are going to be given the ability to use biometrics um, to log into their various accounts. And then that's going to work its way down to consumer accounts and such. So biometrics has taken a long time, just like video phones or something. Sometimes these, you know, these technologies come a little bit quicker than they should. But, you know, you work on it, you work on it, you work on it. And then eventually you start to start to make a difference. So the good news for me and Brandon is, is that we're, we're going to get away eventually from passwords and it's going to look more like put your finger on the keyboard or put your eye into the webcam or, 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 or put your finger and, and, and thing for the ATM machine and get your money and, and it, it'll be more reliable. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, that's, 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 we're finally getting to that point and it's becoming more and more prevalent. But that looks like the ultimate solution, you know, some sort of combination of biometrics and, and pin password combinations, et cetera. It'll probably be layered so that there's probably two or three different things yeah, going on. I mean, you look at William. William was saying uh, secure your internet browser. Many people have all their passwords stored in their, their browser. If someone has physical access to your lo logged in machine, they can easily log to, into your account and even get your right. password and log from other places. It's even easier than that, William. Uh, they can actually <laughs> you know, get access to your browser through remote access or right. malware or whatever. And what happens is because that's saved in a temp folder, part of the browser's you know uh, system or you know its code, you can actually pull it right from it. So yeah, you're right. I mean, people shouldn't be saving their passwords in their browser to for convenience. Uh, then he said, I'm concerned about how to, to do a password change if you uh, you have to get surgery. So we're talking about bioscans. What happened? <laughs> like, would you right. have to get you know? Would you have to get surgery? Well, I mean, that's where you know evolution is going to come. It might be something where you scan something or you pull it up and you do a swipe, and all of a sudden it pulls up your identity. It, it you know, it does a uh, a code scan or a code reset, and then it updates the device in your hand, and then you're off and you're going again. So exactly. I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're doing that way now. Going back into biometrics where you're using fingerprint on an iris, the one challenge that we have to look at is that because of how the way the technologies are rising, we see a lot of this in Mission Impossible and all these movies. Oh, what yeah. happens is these things are starting to become real where you can use glue, right? You can oh, yeah. use glue and capture someone's fingerprint and then put that, you know, that layer of glue. And I'm, I'm sure all of us did this in school where you glue your thumb and you kind of put it over and then you peel it off. You peel it off and it's right there. Right? Exactly. Well, there's different tools that you can use to lift the fingerprint. Well, if you lift the fingerprint, put it on your thumb and because of now it's when the bio signature is one, it's looking for the fingerprints and two, it's looking for the heat signature. So if you put on your thumb and you do that and it's a thumbprint, potentially that you can use as a compromise. And I don't, I'm waiting to see how they're going to overcome that. Well, see, as we pointed out earlier, this, it's probably going to be like a combination of different things. There is no single solution, you know, fingerprints on a door pad in, in, in winter in the harshest conditions getting into my office may be a problem because my hands are frozen <laughs> or something, you know, eyes blurry from a weekend of drinking or something. Or, or maybe take a look at this, you guys. When the, when the Office of Personnel Management got hacked into, guess what they stole? along with the 21 million data records. They stole fingerprints, mm -hmm. okay? That information is gone. All of those employees who registered their fingerprints with that federal agency, that information is gone. So those people aren't gonna be secure when the technology comes online and says, let's use fingerprints of federal employees because somebody in Russia or China or Yugoslavia, wherever they are, are gonna be logging in with fingerprints of those same federal agency employees. Exactly. So yeah, there's, there's going to be a significant uh, learning curve in terms of what do you do when I register my biometrics in a central database and that database gets, ha gets hacked. 
Mm -hmm. We'll probably have to take a look at some lab to talk about how to get away from one central location where I'm compelled to hack into now. I got one central point where I can hack into, I can get everything now, right? Right. So we, we probably want to take a look at that on another blab in terms of how do you get information from one particular area, so distribute it out so that I only get one one data set and, and then there's another data set and, and, and it's spread all over the planet somewhere or something. Well, yeah, I mean, we're talking about different sites that you have warm site, hot site, right? Right. Cold site where, you know, a hot site and just kind of give you guys, if you guys don't know, I'm sure you guys do, but if you guys don't know what these terms are, you know, a cold site is when a site is down. It is a data, it's a backup site where you can, you know, come up from if you, know, you have a disaster, or a, you know, maybe it'd be a tornado hit your building, whatever that may be, and you can recover. Well, the cold site is where you come up from and you just have to boot everything up. A uh, warm site is where things are kind of up, but you know it takes some time to restore. A right. hot site is when it's now a mirror, like you don't lose any uh, connectivity. Where if that when the main site goes down, your second site is automatically up, and your staff just has to move over there, and everything's back up and going. So you're, you're talking about like you know cont uh, continuity when when it comes to business, you know data, employees, you know you know functionality. So exactly. Um, so I mean, we're coming up on on ten minutes left in the in the the show today. Uh, did you guys have any questions uh, for us or any comments you guys want to you know just let people know about when it comes to you know security awareness? So Monty, one of the things that I wanted to ask you: How important do you think it is for people of all sizes to do a security awareness course? Um, I, I think it's essential. Um, for a lot of different states all over the United States, you, 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 we, we have catastrophes, catastrophes. We have national, uh, um, I mean, we have, um, we, we have, uh, national disasters that occur in each and, you know, each and in every individual state, of, you know, to some extent you have earthquakes in California, you have tornadoes on the East coast, you have hurricanes, uh, you know, in Florida, or whatever, everyone, typically familiarizes themselves with a practice drill, right? right. So to, as far as I'm concerned, to not have uh, a, 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 a program of cyber awareness where family and the students or the people in the office not practice a drill for cyber awareness to constantly go through some checks, you know, every so often to see how do we look as far as whether or not we're, we're uh, able to respond and, and 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 identify and et cetera to these threats is equivalent to not having an emergency preparedness kit in your home or your office or your car. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I mean, I think one thing that I'm finding we're neglecting as a society is having it in all forms. I mean, some companies do it when you're hired on that year, there's a security awareness training you know, some companies do it and make it essential. Some people do it and like as an afterthought, you read it, you know, you sign off the form and you're good to go. It's kind of this, you know, secondary thought. You did you do it? Okay, good. You're good. You're good to go. Schools, like we talked about before, should be in schools. Parents, you know, parents, teacher meetings and all that. Parents should be kind of going through cybersecurity awareness, especially when we look at, you know, we talked about this several uh, labs ago about, you know, child, uh, child issues online, child you know, pornography, compromises, things like that, their identity being stolen. I mean, all these things. I mean, we have to look at when it comes to security awareness, we have to look at the education needs to increase. And and to kind of finish that off, it for me is that that's why starting this month, I have in my system right now I, on knssconsulting.com, if you click on cybersecurity awareness, if you know anyone that needs cybersecurity awareness training or needs information, has questions about cybersecurity, they can join my, my community for a dollar. Oh, good. It's only a dollar to join after 30 days. And they can join for a dollar, ask questions, try it out for 30 days, really kind of get a feel for it. And after the 30 days, it's only $47 a month. So you think about that, the insurance, everything that you pay for. And I don't know if I talked about this. Actually, no, I didn't. So on Sunday, a friend of mine that I've known for quite some time was compromised, but she didn't realize or come to that conclusion that we talked about earlier that, you know, some people get in this fear state and they don't know how to think and they don't know what to do. Well, she got in this fear state of what to do. Right. And what happened was she was calling the companies and she's trying to figure it out and her Apple ID or iTunes account or Facebook or Google or Gmail, like all these identities, Amazon, all these got compromised. 
right? and she didn't know who to talk to. So she's calling all these comments and spending hours. She told me it was about a day, day and a half of time that she spent, and she didn't okay. sleep, right, of trying to figure out what to do. And then she finally remembered, ah, after not sleeping, spending all this time, hey, right. I should I should call Brandon and ask him what to do. So she called me. Within 20 minutes, I already took, kind of gave, gave her the right direction where to go, who she should be calling, okay. how do we set all our passwords, how to secure everything. But we have people around us that are doing this time and time again that are getting compromised and don't know where to go, don't know what to right. do. And that's why we've set up the system is that now we have this area where people have a team behind them, this insurance that they can kind of go, hey, you know what, Brandon, this happened to me. What do I do? Who do I call? Who do I contact? What's, you know, what do I do? And it's a, a clear, you know, sports team that can give you a clear direction of where to go, who to call, what to, to, to do, how to secure yourself and how to do it, secure yourself for the future. And I think what a lot of people are missing is, you know, that support because they call the company and the company bounces them around. I mean, she called Apple and Apple transferred into two different departments. And then finally, you know, wow. they told her she had to call another company because it wasn't her, wasn't them. So oh, now really? she spent hours on the phone with that. So <clears throat> we don't have the time as individuals to deal with it. And the problem is, is that as we know, Monty, dealing with this on with our clients, they've been victimized. They feel terrible about themselves. They feel terrible about their identity and what's happening and what's been stolen. Now right. to be victimized by the company on oh, top sure. of that, because now right. the company's not going to help them help them. And this is why guys like, you know, if you know anyone, I mean, this is why I'm, I'm telling you guys. And one of the main points I'm bringing up this today is if you know anyone, your friends, family members, you know, colleagues, people just, you know, day to day that are really not understanding cybersecurity awareness, have them come sign up for my site. It's only a dollar. It's knssconsulting.com. They'll get so much information. They'll have a support team around them. Evan's saying if the world has acts, resources, uh, information equals equaling their big need and more in investment needed for security of personal and business of now and, and future. Right. Right. And this, yeah. is, what the, this yeah. is what the thing is, is that majority of us, you know, the general population puts security as a secondary thought until it happens. Yeah. So, I mean, that's my, my kind of final closing off is I, you know, really guys, we really have to get out there and be active, really start helping people. I mean, that's why Monty and I are doing the show weekly every Tuesday at 10 AM. I mean, invite your friends, invite your family members, you know, colleagues, business, business friends, clients, uh, subcontractors, vendors, suppliers, invite enemies. Them the enemies. If you got an enemy, Look, they, they can learn too. Okay, I don't. We don't discriminate around no, here. No, no, not at all. <laughs> if if some <laughs> if someone needs help, then then, then they're, they're a person that needs help. Okay, sometimes the best way to convert someone that maybe you don't even love that much, you know, for whatever reason, is to extend their hand, extend a hand to them, and say, look, you know, we we may argue, we may be on the different pages or whatever, but look. Um, I want you to be secure because it ultimately affects me because believe it or not, the world is networked together. And if you get the flu and, and you're hanging around me, I get the flu, right? Exactly. So the same with viruses on the internet. If your computer is not safe and your network is not safe and, 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 and that's spread to me by attachment or some other form of, you know, working, uh, interacting together, guess what? My computer can get compromised because of the virus. So as we, as, as we look at the big picture, that it's no different from an epidemic of some sort of influenza or something, it, 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 you know, as compared to a virus on the internet, there's no difference. If all of us are healthy and we're practicing good, safe uh, computer etiquette and uh, cyber awareness, that cuts down on the, the, the hacks, that cuts down on the computer network compromises, that cuts down on the major data breach, breaches that we hear all about uh, on the news and everywhere else. So, so let's in individually do our part, take some responsibility for my very specific part of the internet. Mm -hmm. And if you take responsibility for your very specific part, guess what? We can multiply that by a hundred thousand, by a million. And now all of a sudden the internet overall is a little bit more safe, a little bit more secure because we are thinking about this and it's the forefront of our, of our attention. Oh, exactly. I mean, this is the thing that, you know, Remember, software is, software is hackable, being connected is vulnerable, right? Take that, you know, post it somewhere so you remember that. Exactly. Right? Because anyone, and think of the analogy and what uh, Monty was bringing about the sickness, but think about the chain. You have a chain in front of you. 
the chain is only as, as strong as the weakest link. Right. And if you, if you have a family member, you know, that's not security savvy, that's going to sites that they shouldn't go to, poker game sites, ad <laughs> sites, whatever that may be, yeah. and they get malware, they get adware, they get a virus, and it takes control of their email and spams that out yeah. and tries to propagate that, well, guess what? You potentially might be the most security savvy person, but your yeah. wife might, might not be. And she right. clicks on the email. And then to all of a sudden now your network is compromised because she's on her iPad or you know her iPhone or someone on that line that's on your network and the virus goes out, the malware, the adware goes out and now it compromises your system. And you're wondering, well, how is it through? Because my system has an antiviral, anti-viral, anti-adware program. I clean my system. I do all this great stuff. But now you're compromised. Uh, Evan saying best friends are enemies. They are just angry friends <laughs> when your your help enemy white wit out questions they convert very fast. Yeah, they convert yeah. exactly. It's a challenge, uh, Evan. That's all it is. It's a challenge for us to to convert them over. Yeah, I mean, right. and that's that's what we're saying. Like, just anyone you know, have them come over. I mean, again, our our goal is to help as many as educate as many people as we can. Right? Yeah, to get as many people as we can, make sure they're secure because again. I'm hearing it daily of people that are getting compromised and hearing the tragedy. It's not the point that, oh, well, it's the technology of the lust, but the emotional uh, tragedy they've gone through. You know, oh, my God, I've lost this. What do I do? It's terrible. No one's going to help me. I feel hopeless. I feel like no one's going to be there for me. And all these things are happening on top of the trying to you know, uh, fix or resolve their issue. So they feel violated. I mean, it's no different from someone breaking your house. Right and, and disturbing everything, you feel violated. Well, when someone breaks into your systems and, and compromises that, you feel violated. I mean, this one individual that I was talking about for a Sunday, they had pictures stolen, and now they feel violated. Like, you know, wow. oh, there's good pictures yeah. gonna be online. What's going to happen? Are people going to share them? What do I do? How do I how do I fix this? I mean, you can hear the emotion, the tears, and the sadness. And to me, wow. it's like that. That's enough. Like, enough's enough for me. I want to help as many people as I can. That's why, like I said, dollar for the join, forty seven dollars. You know, it's 24 seven, you know, support there where they can ask questions and go through and we're there to, to just provide cybersecurity IT support. And it's from anyone that's, you know, a mom, family member, you know, small business, medium side business, whatever that may be, you know, they need it. Everyone in this, in this area needs that type of support to be able to ask questions, to be able to say, you know what, I have this issue. What do I do? How do I secure? I'm buying this product. You know, what do I need to know about it? And have someone do the proper research for them to be able to find it. Because, again, sometimes the salesperson, and I talked about this a few episodes ago when I was in Best Buy and I told the guy that the the, the baby monitor that he was selling can be hacked. And I showed him the video on YouTube. His eyes were wide open. You could see him kind of go, oh, what do I do? How, why isn't the, 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 the vendor, the manufacturer telling us that the, these can be compromised? I sold, and this is what he said, I sold 15 this week. Right? And these are the oh, things. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was important to him. Well, this is the thing. It's like now the reality <laughs> of he, he potentially compromised 15 families. Unknowingly, it wasn't his fault. He didn't mean to. But unknowing to him because he didn't have enough information about the device right. Right, to understand it because they don't think about security. They think about the benefits and the features. Well, when he they sold that device, what happened was he didn't realize the security risks of selling it and the vulnerabilities in the device. But now he, he basically compromised the family. Now they have a vulnerability. He didn't know that. And unknowns to him. And the problem with that is now is now he, what does he do? He can't contact the family and say, oh, can you bring that device back? Right? So now he has to learn, he has to educate, and that's just yeah. one. That's one salesman. That's one person, yeah, on one shift, <laughs> you know, in one store. So, exactly, exactly. Yeah. multiple Best Buys and, you know, a different multiple locations. But, again, this is why, like I said, guys, do me a favor, do Monty a favor, share this out, share this with your family members, your friends, your enemies, you know, you know, people yeah. you like, you don't like, whatever that may be, share this out, get them to come here and start asking questions, get them to join the community, be part of it. Cause again, the conversation there, even if you guys want to join the community and be other experts to help other people, you're more than welcome. And this is this challenge for today. You guys, I usually come up with a cyber literacy word or something, but this is a phrase and this is a challenge for you guys, everyone. There's an individual working with Carnegie Mellon. She wants to get the word out to 10 million people 
in terms of educating them about cyber awareness. I want to challenge that. I want to get the word out to 15 million people. I want this blab. I want our videos, our uh, businesses, whatever. I want. I want. I wanted to get the. I wanted to get the word out to 15 million people. You know that there's games. There's password checkers out there. There's uh, our, 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 our blogs and our podcasts, articles that we've written. I want to get the word out there in general that there's cyber liter there's cyber awareness, education, and training that, that's available and that, that we can push out there to 15 million people. Mm -hmm. So on some level or, or another, we can, we can make 15 million people aware that you don't have to struggle with the idea of, of uh, securing your phone and your 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 uh, your laptop to desktops, uh, house, office, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because there's a resource here, and let's get the word out there. Okay, bring them back here, pass the pass this information around, and let's see if we can and let's see if we can educate 15 million people uh, as soon as possible. Uh, hopefully within 12 months, uh, of what what it means to be cyber aware. For sure. So Monty, we're ending the show. What should we talk about next week? Uh, that's a good question. I, I had a number of different things that um, have we talked about. What do you think about ad blocking? Does, does that have any relevance to you as oh, far sure. as uh, helping us with uh, keeping safe and our information or whatever? Well, yeah. Let's talk about all the wares, the adware, the malware. Oh, okay. Well, let's talk about all the wares that are out In there. In general. Okay. Good, right, good it, and bad. Yeah, because, I mean, we've got different ones, like you said, adware, you know, malware, you know, there's different types of, you know, code that is out there that's going, wants to compromise right, in okay. some way of get the data, get your back end of somehow. And if right. we're not aware of what we're clicking on or even if we, we talked about cryptography, right, and steganography where they can be in the back of an image, right, or a file that you don't know about and you click yeah. on it thinking it's a Word document or it's a PDF and really it's not. Uh, werewolves. <laughs> well, we can even talk about werewolves and garlic and how to use garlic to get away, get rid of them. Right? Yeah, whatever or works. <laughs> or is it a silver bullet? I think it's silver bullet. Right. Werewolves, I guess, as, as in software, I guess. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think, um, I think there's a lot to be said about software and what we need to do to, to secure software in general. It seems like more and more resources are spent on um, uh, how to structure, how to develop software so that it's safe and secure, but we're failing to realize 10% of software is actually structured with security in mind, maximum. The re remaining 90% is what? Creative mm -hmm. <laughs> and imaginative. You know, I want this to do something really exciting for the user. I want, to, I want it to stand out, I want it to be flashy and glitzy. So unfortunately that 90% is where the vulnerabilities and, and, and where, where, they, where the, um, the opportunity to have coding that's not optimized correctly or something. So uh, yeah, when it comes to wares in general, that's where we have a huge uh, opportunity to better look at what, what it means to um, make sure that, 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 that we're doing as much as possible to protect the devices and the people and the privacy and, and all of that. It's a definitely a good point. So yeah, let's, let's cover that uh, next, uh, next Tuesday, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Make sure you guys follow Monty and myself and subscribe. Uh, you can actually subscribe to my email list where you'll get emailed directly to your email box. It's on my website, knssconsulting.com. Uh, and again, share this out. We're going to be talking about wares. We'll talk about werewolves, right? Uh, right. All the that are out there. So all make right. sure. Uh, hey, Evan, see you next week. Uh, uh, thank you, you for guys. joining. Awesome Evan. show. Appreciate always you. great well, job. Keep it. Guys. Thanks, guys. And yeah, so Monty, next week we'll Good. talk about that and then have it out for the wares that are out there. <laughs> right. Thanks. Uh, was that Evan <laughs> or was that William? <laughs> Thanks, William. I really appreciate it. That's, that's a very good way of putting it. All right. <laughs>